Hello, welcome to our lecture on deep learning. Today's topic is gradient descent. We've already applied optimization algorithms a lot and we've also touched on the optimization algorithms. But now let's deep dive a little bit in the gradient descent algorithm. To get a better intuition, let's look at gradient descent as for one dimensional optimization problems. So the goal is to minimize a function. So for convention, we usually talk about minimizing functions. Of course, you can also maximize a likelihood by minimizing the negative likelihood, for example, or log likelihood. So minimizing, maximizing for convention, we talk about minimizing. Okay, so we have a one dimensional function, so a function that goes from R to R. And in order to get sort of a mathematical intuition for why gradient descent works, let's look at the first order Taylor expansion of this function. Taylor expansion you always do at a point x, right? And then you say that f at the point x plus some deviation from x, uh, which is epsilon in this case, is equal to the function value at this point plus term that is linear in the first derivative of f. So in this case, it's e times or epsilon times f prime of x. And then because we are only doing a first order Taylor expansion, we're sort of ignoring all of the remaining. There's a estimate of this difference between the approximation and the true. In this case, O of the square of epsilon. And if we have this approximation, then you see that if we move a small epsilon into the direction of the negative gradient is a way to reduce the value of f slightly. So we're taking the direction of the negative gradient, so we're taking minus f prime of x and a small bit in that, so we are multiplying that by a small so-called step size, eta. It's larger than zero, but it's typically a small number. Now, if we plug that in for our epsilon, then we see that f of x minus this little step that we're doing in the direction of the negative gradient is equal to f of x minus eta times a term that is the square of the derivative of f. Remember, we're taking for epsilon f prime times eta, so we're getting the square of f prime which is a positive number because we're assuming that f is not vanished, so it's non-zero, so the square is a positive number. We're multiplying that by a small positive number, so this whole term is positive. There's a minus in front of it, so this whole term is negative. So this leads to a, so far up to here, this leads to a reduction in our function value estimate. And then we have this term here in the end which in this case, because we have epsilon squared, becomes eta squared times f prime squared, if you plug in minus eta f prime. Now this, of course, can be larger or smaller than this. And if the value of eta is small enough, then this will actually be smaller. So let's look at why this is the case. Well, we basically have something that is f prime squared here and here, so we have quadratic terms in f prime and we're left with something that is in eta. In one case, it's linear in eta. Eta has to be larger than zero, so we're only going in, in this direction. Otherwise, we could also go in the negative direction, but saying that eta is larger than zero. So we have a linear term in this direction. And then we have a quadratic term in this direction, so this would be O of eta squared, and here we have something that is linear. What we can say is that for small values of eta, the linear term will dominate the quadratic term because the quadratic term close to zero is very small compared to the linear term. However, if we choose a large eta, at some point the quadratic term becomes dominating. So thus, we do reduce the function if we plug in an eta that is small enough. So we do make progress since n f prime squared 
is larger than zero and this term is negligible for small values of eta. So for sufficiently small eta, the higher order terms become irrelevant and hence the function value after our update. So remember we were at x and now we are at x minus eta f prime, our update becomes smaller than f of x. This gives us an update rule for our gradient descent. that we can iterate x on. So every iteration, we are evaluating the function at the new point x, we are computing the derivative. If the derivative is not close to zero, then we are updating x for the next iteration as given by this update rule. Thus, the function f should decline. Let's look at an example where we are starting with initial value x and then we choose our small learning rate, eta larger than zero. And now we iterate using this update rule until the stop condition is reached. And the typical two stop conditions are that you measure the magnitude of the gradient, or in our one dimensional case, the absolute value of the first derivative. If this is small enough, so smaller than some say, 10 to the minus six or so small constant, then you would stop your gradient descent or to avoid this running forever. If the number of iterations has exceeded a certain value, then you would also stop. For example, this could happen if you choose your learning rate too small, you may, may make very small steps. So we want an alternative update rule. Or if also if we choose our learning rate too large, then it may actually happen that we don't reach our optimum as we see. So we need a second fallback criterion to stop. But this one was would be actually, okay, we're done. We have minimized the function. And this would mean that, well, we're actually not yet there, but we have to stop for time reasons and then maybe throw a warning or an error, you know, because we haven't really minimized the function. So in this example, we look at x squared. So it's just a normal parabola. We have our initial value x equals 10, and then our learning rate equals 0.2, and we are optimizing according to gradient descent. So we go from here to here, to here, to here, and so on until we reach the optimum. And we do this for 10 iterations and we're pretty much at the minimum. Now, the learning rate is an important, important hyperparameter which can be too small or too large. So if it's too small, the result will be that x will update very slowly and we require too many iterations to get a better solution. So for example, if in our example, if we go with the learning rate of eta equals 0.05, start here, start here, and then after our 10 steps, we were still very far from our optimum. If on the other side, we choose a learning rate that is too large, such as 1.1, then we may also not uh, reach our optimum but we can even diverge. So large absolute values of eta times f prime might be too large for the first order Taylor expansion. And in this case, our quadratic term might become significant and dominate the reduction that we just said. So we cannot guarantee for large learning rates that our reduction is enough to, to, to be larger than this quadratic term. So the quadratic term may actually lead to an increase of the function. So in our example, we're starting with a learning rate of 1.1. We start again at an initial x value equals 10. And with our too large learning rate, we're actually overshooting the optimum. And in every optimization step, actually we are increasing the function value because we chose our learning rate too large. And instead of going towards our minimum here, our optimization procedure actually diverges and our function becomes bigger, not smaller. Now this parabola is um, clearly a convex function. Let's look at what can happen for a non-convex function. So in convex functions, we basically are guaranteed to find a global minimum if we 
actually find a minimum. So every minimum is a global minimum. For non-convex functions, that doesn't need to be. For example, if you look at the function x, so we have a linear component times uh, cyclical components, cosinus cx, in the range between minus 10 and 10, we see that this has two different minima. And non-convex functions, actually depending on the learning rate, we might end up in different minima. So here in this example, we start at x equals 10, doing one step, and we're actually jumping from this one region where the one minimum would lie, which is here, to this other region. And we're finding a different minimum. How well this works depends on our learning rate and on how well conditioned the problem is, where typically we call a problem well conditioned if the function is not too wiggly, or in multiple dimensions, also if the curvature is not too different between different dimensions. Of course, in deep learning, we are interested not in one-dimensional functions, but multivariate functions. So typically, we are taking a set of many parameters, for example, weights, or uh, parameters of a deep neural network, to then compute one objective function that we want to minimize. Typically, this objective function is a loss. So we are dealing with functions f that go from r to the d, so that take a vector of parameters as an input. So this is the vector of all our network weights, and that then compute our objective functions. And we want now to minimize our objective function with respect to these parameters. So we want to find the set of parameters that yields the lowest objective function. So here we have an example where we have two dimensions, x1, x2. So we have a vector x that every vector is then a point somewhere here. We have the level sets of this function. So all the points on this actually have to yield the same objective value. And if we go here from level set to level set, we are increasing the function. So here we have larger f, and here we have a smaller f. In this case, of course, we're not dealing only with the derivative of f with respect to x, but we have a gradient. And Remember that the gradient is the vector of all the partial derivatives. So you're looking at the function that keeps all the um, parameters constant and just changes one single dimension. That is what a partial derivative is. Basically, it's the derivative of this function keeps everything constant except for one parameter that you might want to change. And you do this for every single dimension. And that gives you your gradient vector. And this gradient vector is something like the direction of steepest ascent. So it's the vector that shows you sort of a rate of change at this point x that you're currently with respect to each dimension xi. So the partial derivative is the rate of change of f with respect to that particular coordinate xi. Also for multivariate functions, we can do a Taylor series expansion. So the Taylor approximation the first order looks as follows. So in this case, again, we have f at point x plus some deviation of x. And in this case, epsilon is not a single vec a value, but it's a vector of values. So the entries are the deviation in each coordinate that you go away from x. And f of x plus epsilon is approximated as f of x plus a term that is linear in the gradient. So you have epsilon transpose times the gradient. So there's a vector vector product plus Again, a quadratic term, and in this case, it's quadratic in the norm of this epsilon vector. So you have O of the norm of epsilon squared. Again, the direction of steepest descent in terms of epsilon is given by minus the gradient of f at this point x. And similarly to before, in order for actually getting a reduction, we need to choose a learning rate larger than zero and multiply it with this direction of steepest descent. And this yields our update. If we plug in 
epsilon equals minus eta gradient of f of x, we get f of x minus eta gradient f of x equals well, f of x minus eta times the gradient transpose times the gradient plus this higher order term which becomes O of the norm of eta times the gradient of f squared. And now you can pull out eta, which gives you something that is quadratic in eta. So again, we have a term that is in O of eta squared. And as before, for small values of eta, we would get a reduction in the functions. For large values of eta, we cannot guarantee that we would reduce the function. So let's look at this example now. So here we are starting for this quadratic or parabolic function that has x1 squared plus 2x2 two squared at an initial point minus 5 minus 2. So this is a point x0 computing our gradient, which is always 2 times the first coordinate, so 2 times minus 5, and the second coordinate is 4 times x2, so it's 4 times minus 2. And then we walk in the opposite of this gradient vector with a learning rate of 0.1, and then we go from here to here, to here, to here, and so on, towards um, the minimum which will be in this region here. In order to speed up gradient descent, we can also use the second order Taylor expansion, which is a more accurate or closer approximation at this point x to our function f. So the second order Taylor expansion looks as before. So we have f at x plus this difference vector epsilon equals f of x, the place where we're doing our Taylor expansion, plus our linear term, epsilon transposed gradient of f, plus now a squared form in the Hessian matrix. Hessian is the matrix of all the second partial, second order partial derivatives. So it's a d by d matrix, symmetric and we get our squared form. So it's epsilon transpose the Hessian times epsilon times one half. And the Taylor series expansion becomes more accurate so that every order, we're taking an additional power to this difference term. So in this case, what we're left with is O of the norm to the power of three of epsilon. Thus, for a small epsilon norm, this actually um, decreases much quicker. How do we work now with the second order Taylor expansion? Well, the, this part here is actually an approximation that is quite accurate at this point x that has the same function value at this point x, it has the same gradient at this point x, and it has the same Hessian matrix at this point x. But then it's, you know, the higher order terms are different and it's a parabolic function. It's a function that we can minimize in closed forms, similar to as we have done it with linear regression. So how do we minimize this? Well, we can take the derivatives of this Taylor expansion, or actually we can compute the gradient of this function. So the gradient, this is the gradient of F Taylor and set that to zero. In our lecture, we have already used the Newton update in the context of logistic regression, where we have compared the gradient descent algorithm, which is the so-called steepest descent, because the negative gradient is the direction of steepest descent, and we're going in gradient descent in this direction, to 
our Taylor series derived Newton Raphson algorithm, which makes use of the curvature of our optimization problem to much faster converge. Now, logistic regression is a convex optimization problem. So we're guaranteed to find, well, if we find an optimum, we're guaranteed that this is the global optimum. However, let's see what happens if the function is non-convex. Well, if we apply Newton's method to a non-convex problem, then we have the problem that we are dividing by the second derivative in one dimension, or in multiple dimensions, we are, in order to get the update, we are multiplying by the inverse of the Hessian. So we're taking, remember the update was minus the Hessian inverse times the gradient. Now, if the Hessian is not a positive definite matrix, which means that I, all the eigenvalues of the, the Hessian are positive, then it may happen that we're actually increasing our function instead of decreasing. So in one dimension, it's easier to see because then we're actually we're dividing by the second derivative and if this second derivative is negative, we are actually increasing f instead of decreasing because we, our update is minus a negative number, which means that we have a plus there. For example, let's look at f of x equals x times cosinus cx. Well, if we're doing updates with exactly epsilon equals to minus h inverse times the gradient, you can always multiply this by an eta. If eta equals 1, then this is exactly what we had before without the eta. Then we're starting at our point x equals 10, and we're going down. When the next step, it may happen because we are here deriving at a point where our second derivative is negative, we're actually moving to a completely different point, so diverging. We don't arrive at our minimum where we would actually want it to have gotten. However, if we set the learning rate smaller, then in this case we would go to this minimum. So. Be careful when applying Newton's method to non-convex problems because it can diverge because of this problem here that the second derivatives can be negative. Now generally um, when you can use Newton's method it tends to be a good idea to do so. It tends to speed up algorithms even if you take a bit care of non-convex optimization problems. However um, it requires you to compute the Hessian and then actually to solve an equation system in the Hessian or to invert it, which is actually a cubic operation in D. But already computing this D by D matrix can be hard for larger values of D. For example, in deep learning, we are often working with billions and billions of parameters. There it would be infeasible to even store the Hessian matrix. Don't think about even trying to invert it. So for deep neural networks, working with the Hessian may be prohibitive because it's such a large matrix. It costs storing O of d squared entries. In principle, you could think of computing it via a backpropagation algorithm. However, we would need to apply backpropagation to the backpropagation call graph, which is very expensive. If we still want to leverage the curvature of our optimization problem, so to still make use of second order information, we need to think about approximations to Newton's method or yeah, approximations to the Hessian matrix. And one common approximation uh, that is used is to work only with the diagonal elements of the Hessian. So this operation diag actually takes a matrix, in this case HF, and constructs a new matrix that only contains the diagonal elements. So if you have H, then diag of H is a matrix that has zero everywhere, but has the H11, H22, 
and so on until h d d diagonal elements on the diagonal lens. So this is actually only has d non-zero entries here. Yeah? And computing the inverse of such a diagonal matrix is also easy because the inverse is just a matrix Just a matrix that has still zeros here. It has H11 one, one inverse, so 1 divided by H11, one, one, 1 divided by H22, two, two, 1 divided by HDD. So not only does that have only the non zero values, so we can actually store only the non zero values, we can also easily compute the inverse in O of D operation. So it's linear time to invert it. And thus the actually computing inverse times the gradient, you just have to scale the individual entries in X with the corresponding diagonal entries of one divided by the diagonal elements of the Hessian. Obviously, it's an approximation, so if you do this, it won't work as good as the full Newton method. However, it's typically much better than not using it. For example, if you have, a, say, we have a two dimensional problem and we're doing an optimization problem where we have a weight corresponding to one feature in meters, x1 in meters. And we have our x2 in millimeters. Then already small steps in x1 would change the problem a lot. And you need large steps in x2. So typically our optimization problem, if you look at the, the level sets, they would be very slanted in this direction. So if we make small steps in this direction, changing the function a lot. If you make small steps in this direction, the function doesn't move a lot. Now, if you only apply standard gradient descent, it actually tends to go like this. So you say this is your initial point and it tends to go make an update, make an update, make an update, make an update, and then it tends to wiggle this region. And by using the information about the curvature, it will actually tell you that there are different scales in these two dimensions and it will speed up the convergence a lot for problems like this where you have these very long, long drawn level sets. So there is huge interest in at least estimating the entries of the um, Hessian or the, the diagonal values of the Hessian in deep learning. So in stochastic gradient descent optimization, there are many algorithms that try to estimate the main diagonal elements of the Hessian. Another term that denotes these algorithms that work with the diagonal elements of the Hessian to improve optimization is called preconditioning because here this operation of taking the gradient and multiplying with these entries of the the diagonal of the Hessian matrix, you're basically rescaling these gradient entries in that moment. And in the optimization literature, it's thus often called preconditioning of the gradient. So this, And you can think of it as actually selecting a different learning rate for each coordinate. So think about taking your gradient, you scale each uh, dimension, and then you apply gradient descent with this rescaled gradient with a single learning rate this is equivalent to having a different learning rate for each dimension where the scaling factors times your scalar learning rate would be your coordinate wise learning rates. In order to avoid overshooting when applying a too large learning rate, you can actually check whether you have overshot and then track back. And these methods are so called line search methods where you're looking at your optimization direction, for example, your gradient or your um, Newton direction or your preconditioned gradient. And um, along this direction, you're evaluating F uh, at various points. And if you see that the function value gets too large at 
your learning rate times your update, then you're reducing your learning rate and you do the same thing again and you try. And this is so-called line search because you're basically searching for a point where your function decreases along this gradient direction. So in each iteration, we use a gradient given, for example, by the gradient, but it could also be the Newton direction. It could be anything. Yeah? So it's just some, some direction. And then we perform a binary search in order to minimize f to find a good step length to reduce the function f. Ideally, you would minimize it exactly. Typically, one only looks that it actually reduces it sufficiently. Because we don't have to recompute our direction, this is very efficient typically, and generally this algorithm tends to converge rapidly. However, in deep learning, each function evaluation is already half as costly as computing the gradient, pretty much. So each function evaluation is expensive, and each step of the line search requires you an evaluation of the function, um, of the objective function, on your entire data sets. That's why in deep learning, it's actually not applied that much. So generally, this is a very widespread optimization technique, but it's not so much uh, used in, in deep learning optimization. Let's summarize our tour de force on gradient descent. So the most important thing to take home is that the learning rates matter. So they shouldn't be too small then you don't make progress. They shouldn't be too large because then your function diverges. So you want to get it just right such that you're making good progress without actually diverging. Gradient descent generally can get stuck in local optima if your function is not convex. And in higher dimensions, adjusting the learning rate is even more complicated. Thus, we're often actually working with methods that have different learning rates for each dimension. Typically, they are based on estimates of the diagonal element of the gradient, so so-called preconditioning methods. So you're basically trying to estimate the diagonal elements of the gradient in some form, and we look at different methods to do so, or that, to, that try to do so in the next lectures. Newton's method is a lot faster once it has started working properly in convex problems. So once you run into an optimum and you stay there, then it converges very rapidly. However, there's the problem that you have non-convex problems that you may actually increase your function. So you have to be careful of that. So typically, a lot of the Newton methods implementations actually have a lot of checks to, to catch these cases where um, Newton methods goes wrong. So they typically have adjustments, and then they are often also applicable to non-convex optimization because they have fallbacks. And with this, I want to say thank you, goodbye, see you next time.